Good morning, adventurers. My name is Ben, and welcome to a morning show where I sit around, drink some tea, and talk about D&D. Mm. So first up for T&D today, we have the All Black Help It's Again mug um, that I've had several times on the show before uh, because it, it feels like I am currently stuck in a never-ending cycle of working a lot. So Help It's Again. Um, inside of it, we have some Tension Tamer. I just got out of a very long tech rehearsal, so it feels appropriate to have that. Again, that is from Celestial Seasonings. Uh, if you have not uh, seen me drink it on the show before, that's a little odd because I do have it probably once a week at least, ish. Somebody could probably figure that out. Uh, I'm not going to, but that seems about right to me. Uh, highly recommend it. It is a uh, really good, just kind of like end of the day kind of thing. Caffeine, there are no caffeine, pretty neutral flavor, but it is pretty like deep and full. I guess. Um, so, I do highly recommend it if you are looking for something that fits that kind of bill. Mm. And then, moving on to what we are actually talking about today. It is Thursday today, which means that we have my favorite day of the week. Third Party Thursday, and we are talking today about one of the books that I was most excited to get when it came out. We are talking about the Grim Hollow player's guide uh this thing is amazing and i love it and i'm really excited to get to talk to you guys about it here today um back in season one i talked about the um uh campaign guide grim hollow campaign guide um and it was it actually continues to be i think one of the most popular videos that i've ever done uh it gets several views a day still somehow so um I am excited to get to talk about this one because it seems like you guys really enjoy me talking about it too, and I really, really love Grim Hollow's stuff, as I've mentioned several times on the show before. Mm. So getting into it, it should be pretty self-explanatory what is in this lovely little book here, but uh, if you don't quite get it, I guess, let me explain. The campaign guide is sort of the equivalent of a DMG for the Grim Hollow specific setting and uh, material. Which would stand to reason, then, that the Player's Guide is a Player's Handbook type thing for the Grim Hollow material and setting. This uh, book is really, really phenomenal. I remember when I backed it on Kickstarter and got the PDF originally, I was so, so excited for it. Because it really leans into uh, the Grim Hollow theme, which is sort of like that uh, horror-based theme. Uh, and I actually found this book before I found, before I found the Campaign Guide. And so I bought the campaign guide as a result of getting the PDF from Kickstarter for this book. And uh, I do not regret it at all. Um, so this book, as I mentioned, is kind of like a player's handbook. It has uh, player-focused things uh, in addition to a couple of little DM sort of tools that you could use in here, which uh, are very exciting. So uh, to start off, there is obviously the introduction, uh, talking about a lot of the different things that you're going to find within the book itself. Uh, and so there are uh, kind of like guidelines for operating within a Grim Hollow based world uh, and particular, particularly their world, Itharis, um, but it, it, they can be applied to pretty much everything uh, within or not within. Following that, uh, there is a section on exotic races of Itharis. There are six of them in here. They are uh, styled in the old style as opposed to the newer style that was introduced in Tasha's because they are, uh, or this book came out in 2021, but around the same time Tasha's would have been coming out, they were publishing this book already. So it, it wouldn't be something that they would have had time to go in and fix as it was coming off the presses, obviously. But honestly, you can take the same concept and just apply it straight to these races if you are looking at that. Um, Following uh, the races of Atharis, the specifically those are the exotic races of Atharis, like they're the ones that provide stat blocks. Everything lives there. That is just sort of thrown in there as, hey, you can stat these as well. Uh, following that, uh, there is a little like section on the lands associated with Atharis, um, kind of like a gazetteer kind of deal. 
uh, which is interesting to read about and does help with some world building if you are looking to do some like horror based stuff. It, they have done a lot of really good work developing this world. And so having that in there as a resource is definitely pretty cool. Uh, but it is probably more for DMs than it is for players. But you can use some of that stuff if you know that you are playing in a uh, grim horror based type campaign and uh, you are looking to build a character that is based around that kind of stuff. Following that, there is magic in Atharis. Uh, we are in chapter 4 now, for those of you keeping track. This is how the magic uh, interacts with this world specifically. Uh, again, a good section for DMs. There, are, The stuff in here uh, can really help to help you formulate how magic is going to work within the world that you are creating. Uh, players, this doesn't manifest as much, but you could take this and run with it and help uh, guide your DM along the path that you want to theme your character after, if that is the kind of thing that you're looking for from your game. Uh, then after that, into Chapter 5 on page 38, we hit the meat that I was really excited about when I originally found this book. We hit the player classes and as a, you know, subs subsequent consequence, I don't know which one it is, uh, the subclasses that go with each of the official classes. Now, it is important to know that they, you are not going to find Artificer in this. That's just kind of how it goes. They did, however, release Artificer, I believe, on drive-thru RPG. There were a couple of uh, Artificer subclasses as a free add-on. Um, it's either DMs, Guild, or, or drive-thru RPG. One of the two. Maybe even both. Um, but they released... Um, Artificer as uh, playable subclasses in uh, or on those formats because they could not have them as part of the game license uh, with Wizards of the Coast. So, uh, if you're interested in that, definitely go check that out. But, there are two different subclasses for every single one of the other 12 core classes, which is really awesome. I mean, uh, I love a good book that gives you some solid, solid subclasses, and these are all really cool, and... While Valdas, that I talked about a few uh, weeks ago, I guess, had several regular ones and then a bunch of joke ones, these all stay in theme with the rest of the book, which I really appreciate uh, for a book that is this type of book. Something that is around a theme and doesn't have anything uh, particularly humorous built into it. You know, it just it seems more appropriate to me uh, in this specific case. And there are a couple of really cool ones in there. I'm going to talk about one of them in particular. Well, maybe two of them um, that I really, really like. Uh, just in a second here that are pretty cool. Um, because one of them brings with it a really awesome mechanic that I adore. Um, following those player subclass options, we get to transformations. Which if you remember slash watched my uh, campaign guide video or have read the campaign guide... They introduced a bunch of transformations, uh, including Aberrant Horror, Fiend, Lich, Lycanthrope, Seraph, and Vampire. These add in the Fey, Primordial, and Spectre trans uh, transformations, which are really, really awesome. Plus, they give additional options for those original transformations, which is really cool. I still want to integrate those into my game somehow at some point, because I think that they would be really, really awesome to get to run for, um, and or use as a mechanical thing in the world for. Uh, just because, honestly, it's not that there aren't enough consequences for player characters in the game, but it would be fun if you had one that could, like, flat-out change them or something like that. <laughs> um, something that just, you know, regenerate wouldn't fix. Uh, following that, you have a, a chapter of backgrounds. Following that, you have a chapter of archetypes, which are um, sort of a background adjacent kind of thing that you can use for characters uh it's interesting it, it's not the standout part of this book for me but it, it is definitely interesting uh after that you have spells and then after that you have weapons and magic items and blah blah, blah all the way down um i say all the way down that's the end of it really there is then party inspiration and corruption and session zero which the corruption rules are pretty cool uh, i will say definitely recommend checking those out if you get this book uh but it, that really sort of brings you to the end of what it is that goes on in this book. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to take a quick quick little gander at a couple of these subclasses. Um, I am going to start with uh, not the one that has the really, really awesome mechanics, I think, uh, but instead one that I think is really cool and kind of 
very unique in a very specific kind of way. Um, it is a rogue subclass called the Misfortune Bringer. Uh, obviously, a play on Fortune Bringer. But uh, this one specifically is very, very interesting to me because there are not that many subclasses that are solely built around uh, debuffing your enemies in various ways. And this one really, really is focused on that. Uh, its core sort of feature, you get a couple of different features at level 3, but its core feature is called Misfortunist. Um, you learn two misfortunes from this giant list of misfortunes over here. I say giant, it's like 12 long, which is sizable for a just like base subclass kind of thing that doesn't have any add-ons to it yet. Uh, you get to learn some of those, uh, and those things are things that you can use to mark creatures, disable creatures in different ways. It is built around debuffing enemies, which is fascinating to me, and I really, really do like it. Plus, you get the goodness of being a rogue in general, because rogues are... I mean, they're, they're good. You might hate it. I kind of hate it a little bit, but they're really good at what they do. Um, and, I mean, to be fair, that's kind of how they're built, but, like, they're really good at what they do. So, in addition to uh, your misfortunes that you can pick up uh, and use to debuff enemies... Uh, they have a feature at ninth level called Steel Luck, uh, which essentially uh, allows you to expend what a, a resource that you have called a Jinx Point using a reaction. Uh, when you see uh, a creature within 30 feet of you make an ability check, attack roll, or saving throw uh, with advantage. Uh, when, uh, sorry, you don't expend the Jinx Point, you use your reaction to... To regain a Jinx point by removing the advantage from that creature, which is really, really interesting. Uh, you can only do it once between short rests, but the ability to just suck advantage away from somebody and give it to yourself, like have it be a restorative thing to you, is fascinating to me. And I really, I think that's really cool. Um, uh, da, da, da. At 13th level, you can use an action and expend three Jinx points to cast the Bestow Curse spell. Charisma is your spellcasting modifier. And at 17th level, you pick up improved Steel Luck, where you can use your Steel Luck feature three times, using all or regaining all uses when you finish a short or long rest. Um, so you get that level nine feature three times between rests, <clears throat> which is just, I mean, it's just, it's cool. It's really cool. It's really, really cool. Um, Jinx points, you have four of them to begin with. You regain uh, all of them when you uh, rest at all. And you get two additional ones at the 13th level. So, uh, with Steel Luck, you get five of them between rests. Then you hit 13th level, you end up with seven of them between rests. And then you end up past that. Um, I think it's a really cool sort of debuffing concept. Uh, I wish that there were more subclasses like it. But I also understand why there's not. Because there are very specific ways you can debuff people without it immediately being countered by a lot of different things. Then we are going to go ahead and we're going to look at what might be my favorite subclass in this whole book because of its core mechanic, but it, it also might not be. We are going to look at the Wizard Arcane Tradition, the School of Sangromancy. So one of the uh, cool things about this book is that they introduce a new school of magic entirely, uh, which is reflected in the spells section. Uh, it is the school of sangromancy, school of blood magic, whatever you end up wanting to call it. Um, in order to use those spells, regardless of who you are, if you have one of the spells on your spell list, you have to expend hit dice in order to do it, which I think is really cool. And the school of sangromancy wizards specifically get additional hit dice in order to cast these spells without immediately depleting their own resources. However, when they run out of those extra dice, they can use their own to, you know, go ahead and continue to cast those spells. And these spells are really, really potent spells. Uh, I think that they're really cool. I didn't pull any of them specifically to talk about here, but we're going to talk about the School of Sangromancy real quick because I want to sort of highlight this mechanic they have written in here. Um, so they have, uh, starting at second level, you get Sangromancy Savant, same as like all the other Schools of Magic Savants, you half gold, etc. Uh, but you also get Full-Blooded, which at... Starting at second level, you gain a pool of D12s that you can expend instead of a hit die when you cast a Sangromancy spell. The number of hit dice equal in the pool equals one plus your wizard level, and you totally re replenish that uh, pool when you finish a long rest, which means that 
you get all of those back automatically instead of getting half back like you would with hit dice, which is a really, really, really important feature here because if you have a Sangromancy thing and you are burning hit dice in order to cast those spells, you kind of can't really get those back unless you rest for like a week. These individuals can get those back faster. Uh, then you, at 6th level, you pick up Sanguine Vigor, where starting at 6th level, your hit point maximum increases by 6, and then increases by 1 again wherever you gain a level in this class. In addition, when you cast a Sangromancy spell, you regain a number of hit points equal to the level of the spell. So, a little bit of free healing if you are burning uh, your hit dice or your pool of d12s. Really, really awesome. Because, I mean, wizards always need a little bit more health, right? Let's be real here. Um, plus, you essentially get a half-tough feat for free at level 6. Uh, at 10th level, you pick up Blood for Blood, where when you deal damage to a creature with a spell you cast, you can expend a, and roll a hit die or a d12 from your full-blooded feature and add its result to the damage dealt. Free additional damage, always good, particularly if you're using something that has an attack roll, and you're like, hey, I crit on that, let's throw another d12 on top of it, because why not? Why not? That is just fun for you at that point. Uh, and then at 14th level, you pick up Red Renewal, which starting at 14th level, whenever you finish a short rest, you can choose a number of expended hit dice to recover. Uh, when you do choose a number of expended hit dice equal to half your wizard level and regain them, you regain an equivalent number of dice from your full-blooded feature. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a long rest. That's amazing. Especially in this class, because those dice are your casting pool, essentially. They're the thing that you need in order to cast spells. So being able to just regain them um, when you finish a short rest, fantastic. Also, you can spend a bunch of hit dice and then regain those hit dice immediately at the end of the short rest because of what, because of this feature that you have, which is really, really pretty awesome. Um, and I, I personally am of the opinion that it is a very much underutilized resource to have hit dice be an expenditure in this so the fact that this uses that and then also like pays you back for using them is really really awesome uh, i flipped up or i flipped open uh to the spells i found a couple of sangromancy spells i'm going to read through one of them real quick here just to give you an idea of what we are talking about here um so this is an eighth level necromancy sangromancy spell uh, casting time is one action, range is 60 feet. Uh, components are just somatic and concentration up to a minute. As part of casting this spell, you must expend eight hit dice or the spell automatically fails. This is where having all those Sangromancy dice are important. When you do, roll the eight hit dice expended to cast the spell and total them to determine the creature's creeping death threshold. While the spell remains active, if the creature's current hit points are ever equal to or lower than the creeping death threshold, the creature immediately dies. As a bonus action on each of your turns while the spell is active, you can force the target to make a constitution saving throw on a failure, roll 2d6, and add the result to the creature's creeping death threshold. On a success, add half the result instead. If the creature succeeds on three th saving throws, which do not have to be consecutive, the spell ends early. So, you don't have to use that thing that bumps the DC and forces them to make constitution saving throws, or DC, DC, quote-unquote. Um, but you can, and it speed up this death rate that they are going through. But that means that you can put this spell on, like, an ancient dragon or something like that, and then never use the constitution saving thing, and they can't legendary resistance from it. Uh, but all of the Sangromancy spells require you to spend a number of hit dice or Sangro dice um, that, that are equal to, the number of which are equal to the level of the spell cast. Which is a high price, but those spells are very, very potent, like that one. I mean, that's obviously an 8th level spell, but if you burn 8d12 in order to get that, you're looking at a potential total 96 uh, hit points that as soon as they step under that, they die instantly. And that's just good. That's just, that's just good. So, Grim Hollow Player's Guide. Highly recommend checking it out. Super, super good book. I love it. I think it's really awesome. It's got some really cool mechanics in it. It's got some really cool DM tools as well as player tools in it. Um, and, uh, if you are looking for the, like, style of stuff and you don't really know anything about Grim Hollow at all, first off, I have a video on the campaign guide in the first season, but you can get the Artificer subclasses that were, that, that kind of go packaged with this book out on, I don't remember if it's DMs Guild or Drive-Thru RPG, but it's one of those two, maybe even both of them. So go check that out too.
Yay. Good book. I love this book. Um, so that is everything for that. Moving on to the shows that we have today. It is Thursday, of course, which means we have Critical Role, Authors and Dragons, NADPOT, and LGBT D&D. So uh, please go check some of those shows out, and please let them know that I sent you, because at some point, someone will say something to me about it, and it will be funny to me. That's the only reason. That's okay. Um, anyway... Thank you guys so much for making me a part of your morning routine. I really do appreciate it. And thank you so much in particular to my patrons. You guys are the ones that make this show possible. Uh, if you're interested in becoming a patron, please check out the link to uh, my Patreon in the description of this video. And th thank you guys for sticking with me. I feel like I'm kind of stumbling through words here. I'm very tired. Um, but I really like doing the show, so I'm still doing the show. <laughs> um, but that is everything I have for you guys today. So with all that said, don't forget, drink tea. Play D&D, and keep on rolling. <laughs>